Hallelujah. Lift your hands toward heaven and talk to the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Tonight, do what only you can do. Thank you, precious Lord Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Abba Father. We give you glory. We give you praise. We worship you. We honor you. We magnify your name. Take all the praise. Take all the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Precious Lord Jesus, we honor your name tonight. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's begin tonight from Luke chapter 18 from verse 1. There are two scriptures that whenever I read them or I get to read, I get a bit fascinated. Sometimes I break into laughter because of the interpretation that the Holy Ghost gave me. And this scripture is one of them. The Bible said he spake a parable unto them. And he said in that parable, Luke 18 from verse 1. He spake a parable unto them to this wise. He said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Three key words. Ought. Always. And fainting. It means prayer. It's not a decision you have the liberty to make or not to make. It's a must. Men ought. So it is not something that is that you have the luxury to choose. You cannot but choose it if you are a man. And that's why it fascinates me. Because it dawned on me that the way men are defined in the spirit is not the way they are defined biologically. There are two times Jesus made this kind of statement. The first time he made this statement was in Luke chapter 4. You find the same in Matthew chapter 4. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then here, he said, men ought always to pray. So, the, what makes you a man is not that you are breathing. It's either that you are feeding on the word or that you are praying. So, if you are not feeding on the word and you are not praying in the spirit, you can be called a donkey. And that's why there are many people when they go to sleep, which is come to ride them. Because as they are not praying, and as they are not studying the word, they can become anything in the spirit. That's why you find many people, their destinies are marginalized. A witch sits somewhere and chants incantations, casts some spares, and a great and mighty destiny is wasted because the man is not watching in prayer. And so what will make you live your life and fulfill your destiny as a man. This is one of the secrets. He says, if you are a man, you ought to pray. And the second key word there is not just that you should pray. Because if you only said pray, then you would have prayed when it's convenient. But in this same scripture, he makes us understand prayer is not something you do at your convenience. He said, men ought always 
to pray. Because that gap you cease from praying, a lot can happen. And it is one of such that God's servant revealed to us that somebody else who killed his own child can lay claim on that which is yours. Now, a child is not just one that you give birth to biologically. Your destiny can become your child. And somebody else who wasted his destiny can come and take yours because you are not watching. Have you seen young men for very gifted? They are just walking home and somebody said he's drunk. And he writes into them and shuts down a great destiny because he said he was drunk. Have you seen young men before that are just in a mall and a fool just comes into that mall, removes the, a gun? And shoots people and you hear that 11 died 12 died if you were praying you will not be there because your destiny would have been secured it can take a whisper don't enter that more now and you will wait for five seconds that five seconds will become the difference between life and death but the reason you entered and you were shot is because you are not praying and so your destiny that is your child can be hijacked by somebody else who takes the excuse of being an alcoholic and at the end of the day he's tried to cut but another man has gone to the grave and so he said if you don't pray somebody can kill his own child and come to take yours and also if you don't pray he said your field which is your destiny can become the ground where the devil come to sow tars amongst the wheat because all of the plantings of the devil are done when men are sleeping so jesus knows and so he says that one day that you cease to pray can be the day the devil comes for a visitation but those who understand how life is lived they never give the devil a chance paul said giving no place to the devil and the way you resist the devil is by prayer he said putting on the whole armor of god you will resist him by praying all kinds of prayer and so there are times when you are praying prayers of thanksgiving. There are times when you are praying prayers of intercession. There are times when you are praying prayers in tongues because you have exhausted all the human syllables. But you know it's not enough. So when you are done exhausting human syllables, you enter the language of angels and you start praying the prayers that are deeper than your understanding. Because by all means, men ought always to pray. And the third thing Jesus said is that if you don't pray, you will faint. So the opposite of fainting is prayerlessness. So when you find men that are overwhelmed with life and destiny, that weakness is a product of prayerlessness. And so prayer is not something you are weak not to do. Because your strength actually comes from prayer. So when you feel weak, that's when you should pray. Because that's where your strength comes from. You don't say you are weak, you stop praying. When you are weak, it's a good excuse to pray. Because it's in prayer that strength will come. This is Jesus talking. And so it's not something you take for granted. If you are a man who wants to fulfill destiny, he said prayer must be a must. Ought, not should, not if they desire. It is required that men should pray. And they should not just pray. They should pray always. And if they don't pray always. He said they will faint. And trust me. You don't want to faint. Because the devil is prowling as a roaring lion. Looking for whom he will devour. If he finds you weak in the spirit. He will capitalize on your weakness. And he will plunder you. Tonight we want to look at. Seven reasons why men pray. So that we will pray in this vigil with understanding. Seven reasons why men pray. Because if you don't know why men pray, you may think prayer is a religious activity. If you don't know why men pray, you may think prayer is for those who are preachers. The believer requires prayer much more than the preacher. And you will see why. When you go, when you find tyrants or bullies who oppress people, do they oppress those who are strong? It is those who look weak and vulnerable that they pick on. Even the young bullies 
in primary and kindergarten they have enough knowledge and sense that you don't attempt to bully a man who is equally strong so bullies always for the weak and so if you think prayer is for the apostles the prophets the devil already knows that they are sitting in an office god has empowered them to fulfill ministry it is the ordinary believer who doesn't know his left from his life right in the spirit that the devil comes from that's why you cannot make the mistake of lowering your guard when it has to do with prayer many are deceived waiting for others to pray for them and there are many prophets who want to take money from people and they can call you around 2 a.m in the morning and tell you don't worry i'm on the mountain praying for you sir nobody can pray enough for you you are the first prophet of your life if you want your destiny to count you have to wake up dust your altar knee down there and pray for yourself even your biological parents can't pray enough for you the devil is not resting he is prowling like a roaring lion even the people who were walking with jesus the devil came for them and got judas he got judas and when jesus looked at him the bible said satan entered his heart he got judas and as if that was not enough he came for peter until jesus said simon simon satan desires to have you to sift you like wheat so when a man is not praying he's like wheat he's chaff before the devil you can say i'm with jesus the presence of god is with me i have christ if you don't pray it says satan we sift you like wheat the reason you have weight not to be sifted by the devil is because there is stamina in the place of prayer he was walking with jesus for three years but without prayer he was like wheat satan desires to have you to sift you like wheat the only reason you stand is that prayer will be injected into your foundation and so if men who walk with jesus were at risk of being sifted is it a pastor or an apostle or a prophet you are working with that you will not wake up in prayer and you go and sleep and say my pastor is praying for me do you know how many prayers the pastor need for himself once in a while moved by the spirit he can remember your name in prayer but if you think there's any pastor who carries your name to the altar every day and say Nathaniel must prosper you are joking you are joking when he comes to church and makes a declaration if your faith can catch it you have caught it but i tell you the real insurance for your destiny is your travail on the altar for yourself and so you must learn how to pray and you must pray prayers if you will fulfill destiny this is the battle for every believer and that's why jesus did not say apostles must pray he did not say prophets must pray he said men ought always to pray and not to faint I'm not saying pastors are not praying for you. But I'm saying to fulfill destiny, you must pray for yourself. Before I enter this subject, let me show you something. Like I've been sharing yesterday. Jesus has paid the price to exonerate us from every force that undermines our existence. Jesus has also supplied everything we require for life and godliness and so the quality of our life now is not god's responsibility it's our responsibility when jesus died on the cross amongst other things three things happened number one the old nature was crucified the bible said we were crucified with christ the nature of sin was crucified with christ the significance of the cross is that that serpentine nature that God hates was crucified on the cross. So when we believe in the death of Jesus, it's not a religious cliche, it's a spiritual transaction. Because when he was nailed on the cross, he became sin that we might become righteousness. So the old nature of sin hung on that cross. That's why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ nevertheless i live but the life i now live in the flesh 
I live by the faith of the Son of God that gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 So the old nature was crucified. Number two, the second thing that happened was that every devil that had authority over you was publicly disgraced and stripped of his power. In Colossians 2, 14 and 15, he said, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So when he was on the cross, what he was doing was bullying every demon that wants to oppress you. And so no devil anywhere under heaven has the authority to oppress you anymore. Legally speaking, the right the devil has over you was withdrawn. Just the way we are seated here now, if anybody comes here and slaps you, you have the right to prosecute that person because he doesn't have the authority to slap you. In fact, he can be jailed for attempting that. So any demon that tries to molest you is doing it as an illegal entity carrying out an illegal operation because the authority he had was stripped of him on the cross. And Jesus did not do it in hiding. The Bible said he made a public show of them. So he triumphed over them by the cross by stripping them of their powers. The third thing Jesus did on the cross was that he restored our relationship with God. Because when we sinned, we were separated from God. We no longer had a relationship. Remember when Adam sinned and the angel came into the garden. The Bible said he drove him out of the presence of God and a sword was placed at the gate, swinging on every side, preventing the man from coming into God's presence. Now, when Jesus was on the cross, the Bible said to wit God was in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses upon them, but he granted them access to reconciliation so on the cross jesus reconnected us back to god so the nature the old nature was crucified the power of the devil was taken away and we were reconciled back to god because of these three things that happened on the cross every christian and every believer in christ has the potential of living exactly like jesus nothing having the authority to hinder him anymore However, these spirits are rebellious beings. They don't care that you have liberty. They don't care that you have the right to live a glorious life. They will come to check whether you know. So the devil knows that right now you have authority over him. The devil knows that right now your relationship with God is restored. The devil knows that right now there is no condemnation against you. But he doesn't know you know so what he will do is that he will come with sickness he will come with oppression he will come with every force to check whether you know who you are those of you in the uk hope you know that sometimes the police wants to check whether you know you're right and so when they stop you they say get down from the car and you say why the moment you say why they say kai this one knows something and if they press further, you say, I know my right. I won't step down. Why do you want to search my car? They say, um, they will now change the direction of the conversation. You know why? They know you know. But if you don't know, <laughs> you are in trouble. You may end up in jail for not knowing. That is how devils and demons operate. When the devil comes, he puts a pain on your chest. And then when that pain comes, you are saying, what's happening here? What is going on? Why am I feeling this pain? Hey, could this be cancer? Could this be this? Could this? the, the devil? Ah, the person is not aware that sickness has been taken away. The next day, it will become a lump. And as you are contemplating and walking in fear, the next day you go, they will say they are finding a trace of cancer. But let's do a CT scan. We want to be sure what we are seeing. And because you are not aware, you open the gate, and that thing can become anything. But you see, one of the reasons we pray is that we want to let the devil know that we know that the price has been paid and so when you find a christian who is not praying he is registering his ignorance in the spirit realm but when you find a christian who prays that prayer is a testament that he knows the transaction 
that took place on the cross. So the first reason we pray is that we are responding in knowledge that we know who we are. We are responding in knowledge that we know what was done for us. And so prayer is a legislative activity in the spirit realm. And so when you find a Christian praying, he's not praying because he's a religious man. He is making demand of his right. Have you gone to the court before? When a lawyer is in court, his petition before the judge is called prayer. He's fighting for a right because rights are not gifted. They are taken. And there are many Christians, although they have power with God, they are not manifesting it. Although they have liberty with God, they are not manifesting it. So when Christians gather, you find the sick, you find the oppressed, you find the frustrated. Sometimes it looks as if those who are not even Christians are doing better. Because they know they don't have God. So they use other means to secure their rights. But the Christian that has God is complacent even though he has, he has God. And so prayer is a resistance that we raise against the devil. Prayer is a warfare that we wage against the devil because we are telling him you cannot trespass. We know our rights. The first reason for prayer is to enact and to enforce your right in Christ Jesus. If you are not praying, your right will be taken away. This is why although many, the flesh has been judged, they are helplessly in sin because they are not praying. When you start praying, you will notice that the nature of Christ in you will rise up and shut down the voice of the flesh. That is why many are sick although the price has been paid because they did not present any resistance. And they are not presenting resistance because they don't know what they have. The moment you know what you have in Christ, you cannot but pray. Because every day of your life, you, and because you cannot keep quiet, you will respond with prayer. Because you cannot keep quiet, you will respond by prayer. Because you cannot keep quiet, your resistance will become prayer. This is why you find Christians, they are always fighting in the spirit. Sometimes you wake up, there is pain on your head. What you would have done naturally is to go to investigate. But before you check, you say in the name of Jesus, you devil of infirmity, you have no place in my life. In the name of Jesus, the chains of pain are broken right now. You are already praying. Sometimes you discover that you have all the qualifications, but things are not working. You have the contacts, you have the papers, you have the document, but somehow things are not working. And when you get tired, you go to your room and you say, in the name of Jesus, I command the doors to open. In the name of Jesus, I command the gates to open. Every force resisting me, every force stopping me, I come against you by the power of the Holy Ghost. I command the doors open right now. And not too long, you will see that things will begin to shift in the spirit. Because you know that because you are in Christ, you should prosper. The Bible said, rich as he was, he became poor, that you might become rich. But the last time you checked your life, nothing around you looked like riches. And so you get tired and you say, come on, I need to enforce this provision. In the name of Jesus, I step into prosperity. In the name of Jesus, I step into open doors. In the name of Jesus, I activate everything that is available because you are not a lawyer over your own life. You see why Jesus said men ought to pray. Because if they don't pray, although it's available, they can't take it. And there are many Christians, healing is available, they can't take it because they are not praying. There are many Christians, wealth is available, they can't take it. There are many Christians, righteousness is available, they can't take it. There are many Christians, everything that is available in Christ, they already are in position of it in the spirit. But they cannot materialize it in the natural the reason is because prayer is lacking. So when we pray, we are not doing a religious activity. Prayer is spiritual legality. When we pray, we are enforcing things in the spirit. This is why you cannot afford to pray, pray absent-mindedly. No. No lawyer argues in court absent-mindedly unless you don't know what you are doing. You can't be fighting for your right and you are careless, dozing off, yawning, and then you, you walk out walking. No, that's not how they do this thing. My brother, it is warfare. 
when you are in court, you are deliberating. You are arguing. You are countering your enemies, your opposition. You are looking for their weakness and then you are drawing out your strong reason. Prayer is not something you can do carelessly if you know what it is. My God, I look into the spirit. What Jesus made available to me is a glorious life. I check my life. I cannot see it. And then I'm casual. No, I cannot be casual. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They are thoughts of good and not of evil. To give you a hope and a future. But when I checked, there was no future. I have to create that future on the altar. So it's not something I do absent-mindedly. I go to the altar. Kakakoka. Akora kakatuna. Abaraka tuata. Atetete. Rakakakatua tuatua. I continue praying until I start seeing some visions. Until I start seeing some movements in the spirit. Because I am not about to beg in this life. I know he made me a king and kings don't beg. He said where the word of the king is, there is power. Who can say unto him, what doest thou? But the last time I checked, before I ate, I begged. Before I got a promotion, I begged. And so I come back to myself like the prodigal son. I say enough is enough. No more begging. I am a king. I will function in my status. But the only way I can function that way is to go back to the altar. And so because I don't want to beg, I return to the altar. Ika kurwa, a reggae go sarwash, barak ta akto baka, ragagadida, a zwate, a zos, varagwa, zaga, 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 homa kaya. To the unspiritual, it may look foolish, but you know what you are doing? You are commanding the lines to fall for you in pleasant places. And not too long, that person that should give you the contract will suddenly appear. Not too long, that person that should grant you the favor will suddenly appear. Even they will not know how they showed up. You ordered their steps in prayer. You forced them to appear. You commanded them to show up. That's how this thing works. I'm telling you, this is how the spirit realm is designed. The wise men know that prayer makes things happen. So they pray. I grew up in a village in Katsinala in Benue State. There's no way I should cross many borders to be here talking to you. If I was waiting for luck and chance, it would have taken 10 lifetimes. If I was waiting for human sympathy, it would have taken 10 lifetimes. But I discovered that there was a way. There was a way of entering into what was written concerning you. And so I, I, I took my destiny in my own hands. And I went to the altar and I said, Abba Father, you say you are not a God that favors one over the other. God does not favor one over the other. He has blessed all of us equally. I refuse to walk like a beggar. It's an abomination under the sun that princes are trekking. White beggars are riding on horses. I step into my ordination and as I was praying, oh my God, I was praying, I was praying. Suddenly things began to happen in the spirit. Seasons began to change. Things began to change. You are not ordinary. The Bible said the mystery of the age is that Christ, you, is the hope of glory. That means your life should manifest nothing less than glory. Because every one of us sitting here, God dwells on our inside. God. The fullness of God dwells on our inside. How come we became mediocre? How come we became helpless and hopeless in this life as if we have no God? God forbid. That's why you go to the altar. Because you have discovered that only glory is good enough for you. And so you will not stop until glory manifests. And when glory manifests, it doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your class. Because glory has no regard for racial barriers. Glory has no regard for gender difference. When glory shows, help appears. Prayer. Men ought always to pray. Because everything God has made available to us is at the mercy of our prayers. And so we don't stop. I don't want to go to heaven to discover anything God made me. I'm supposed to discover all of them on earth and leave all of them on earth. I won't go to heaven and discover that I am a man of power. I won't go to heaven and discover that I'm a being of glory. I won't go to heaven and discover that I'm a man of wealth. 
because all of that I won't need it in heaven it is here on earth I need it and so when I'm praying I'm activating everything God has made available and every time you see me it's from glory to glory because if you met me yesterday I have already metamorphosed if you met me today I'm already metamorphosing and by the time you come tomorrow you will see a more glorious version because the part of the just man is as a shiny light it shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day all of us are equally blessed in Christ but the degree of our manifestation is a function of our prayer because prayer is spiritual legislation and I tell you the devil is running around sampling to know those who know. He's checking to find out those who are aware. And those who are not just aware but who are willing to defend it. Many who died had healing in their spirits. Many who ended up poor had wealth in their spirit. They were blessed but they didn't contend. But a generation is sitting before me tonight that is saying we will not stop where we are. Everything God has died for us to be, we will manifest. Everything God has made available, we will manifest. In the name of the Jesus. <laughs> How can he say you are the head and not the tail? And then everything about you is like tail. And then you are quiet. You are sleeping. No way. I won't rest until everything about me it becomes indicative of a head. Because that's what he calls me. I will not leave this world until I become everything he has called me. Everything he has called me. And so when you go to the prayer altar, that is your journey. To become everything he has called you. Sit down for a moment. Why do we pray? Number one. We pray to enforce everything Christ died and rose for us to become. If you don't pray, you will never become they will read it and a point will come you will doubt if it's true because they will show you that the glory of God is on your inside they will show you that you are glorified but when you check your life you will not see the glory Jesus said the glory that you have given to me I have given to them he said him that he foreknew he predestinated him that pre he predestinated he called him that he called he justified him that he justified he didn't say he will glorify. He said he glorified. So it is already in the past tense. But when you check your life, sometimes you will hardly see the glory. And so if you know what to do, you will go to your prayer, prayer closet and say everything God said, I know God cannot lie. And so I will not make it a lie in my own life. I will enforce it by prayer. And as you start praying that violent, explosive and aggressive prayer, not too long you will see that changes will begin to happen because that is what prayer was designed for it is not a religious activity it's a weapon of war in the spirit why do we pray number two hmm. prayer triggers transfiguration it does not only open what christ has made you it transfigures you into the image of the Christ. The Bible says we all with open faces beholding us in the glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed. And so God is not only expecting that you will have what Christ has given. God is also expecting that you will become the reflection of Christ to your world. But you see, what the devil will do is that he will plant corruption in your soul so that you never become like Christ. And so when men meet you, there will be bitterness, there will be anger, there will be fear, there will be pains. And so your heart will be filled with all forms of garbage. Whereas you are supposed to pour out rivers like Christ. And so when you start praying, you will notice that the second thing prayer does for you is that prayer begins to change your molecular structure. And so a point comes when people touch you, they have touched God. This is what the apostles knew and this is what they did. And they learned it from Jesus. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, he said, be a followers of me as I'm the follower of Christ. What has happened to Paul that he has become so much like Christ? That he said, if you see him, you have seen Christ. John said, as he is, 
so are we in this world so the apostles did not just have power because god gave them power they did not just have riches because god gave them riches they did not just have favor because god gave them favor they literally started changing to become like the god that blessed them so when you see them they were not just blessed with the things of god they were becoming like the very god that blessed them and paul said the technology is to keep beholding but how do you behold one of the ways to behold is in the place of prayer and we saw that in matthew 17 verse 2 the bible said as jesus began to pray he said the fashion of his countenance was altered his raiment began to blister and so every time a man prays glory comes out of him because the glory is already on your inside but you don't need the glory inside you you need the glory outside you because it is the glory that is seen on you that affects your generation but you see the way god did it is that he planted the glory inside of you so that as you travel in the spirit the glory will start flowing out of you can i tell you something what men celebrate is not your face it's the glory of god on your life they see and celebrate you find men who carry so much of glory people are blessed that they, they spoke to them people are blessed that they shook them men go through a lot of inconveniences to relate with men who carry glory even these men think they love those people they don't love them it's the glory on their life that they are interacting with and the reason we will become so relevant in our world is that when they see us they no longer see us after the flesh they see the dimension of christ in us that has manifested but the way Christ can flesh out of you is by prayer. There is no prayer you pray that is a waste. Every time you prayed, glory came out of you. Every time you prayed, glory increased on your life. Jesus taught us and Stephen also did it. They surrounded him and they wanted to kill him. And the Bible said he looked into heaven. And he said he saw the Son of Man standing by the right hand of God. And immediately he began to commune with the father and the bible said his face began to glow like the face of an angel how do you think you being a christian can be rejected how do you think you being a christian can be undermined the only basis for that to happen is because you only went with your face you went with a good haircut you went with a good dress but your greatest garment is not a suit is glory because what adam wore in eden was glory and when Jesus came, he restored us into the economy of glory. And so when you meet Christians, Christians are supposed to manifest glory to their generation. Peter was speaking in 1 Peter 2.9. He said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's own special people called for to showcase, to showcase, to manifest the glory, the praise, the excellency of God. And so God wants a, a generation to know him. But it's no longer appearing in the cloud like the days of Moses. The way God appears to a generation now is through men who are able to manifest his glory. But you see, what will cause the glory of God to come out of you is as you travel in the place of prayer. Every time you pray, something oozes out of you. It is called glory. And trust me, you will need that glory in your business. Because when three of you appear and you are all equally qualified, what will make you stand out? will be more than the certificate you got from Oxford. When three of you are competing in a football match or in an athletic competition or you are competing for a job and all your credentials are equal, the reason they will pick you out of the others is because in addition to natural credentials, you came with glory. Because nobody can reject glory. Even those who wanted to kill Stephen, when they saw glory on his life, they were startled. Who is this? What does he carry? Because glory is an element of God. And so anybody who, who carries it becomes like a God to his generation. That was what Moses brought before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh could not kill him. Pharaoh was called the sun God. You don't challenge him, you die instantly. But Moses came with a weight of glory. And Moses challenged Pharaoh ten times. And Pharaoh couldn't stop him. In fact, the last time Moses confronted Pharaoh, he told him you will not see me again that means it's an honor for me to stand before you you will not see me again and true to his word pharaoh never saw him again 
the man came with too much glory that he shut down the strongest civilization of his generation. I know life may be difficult here. Everything is systematized and it looks very rigid and complex. Carry glory. And you will be shocked how the system will bow. The reason the system is rigid is because they have not seen a glorified man. When you walk in with glory, protocols are suspended. Jesus carried so much of it that even the law of gravity was suspended. He ascended bodily into heaven because of the measure of glory he carries. Who told you that the policies the devil is writing? Who told you that the forces the devil is advancing can stop the church? When God raised us as a people, he raised us with glory. And because he raised us with glory, there's no human policy that can stop us. There is no advancement of darkness that can stop us. He said the church will keep marching and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The reason the gate of hell shall not prevail is because when we show up, we won't show up as a congregation. When we show up, we will show up as an army of glorified men. And so when they see us, they cannot gain say, they cannot deny what we carry because it's a force coming from heaven. Why do we pray number two? The reason we pray is because prayer causes the glory of God on our inside to find expression. May you not be known only after your natural abilities. It will be a great limitation. Because that natural ability you have in your lifetime, you will find many that are better than you. The reason you will stand out and keep standing out is because the element of glory that is ascribed to you is unique to you. And if you allow it to find expression, you will always be different in your generation. But it is prayer that will excavate it. Why do we pray? Number three, prayer has the power to change seasons. Do you know the way the devil fights men? One of the ways the devil fights men is that he manipulates their seasons and he eats their times of opportunity. That's why Joel chapter 2, the Bible said, the years that the canker worm has eaten. So canker worms don't eat plants. Palma worms, caterpillar worms, they don't eat grains. They eat years. So you find a man who at the age of 26 is supposed to be a prime minister. At 26, he's still struggling with his education. And then you are wondering what happened. Those years have been eaten. And if nothing is done about it, he will be 50 and he will still be frustrated. Because one of the ways the devil fights is that he eats your years. He eats your opportunities. And so you keep walking through life and it will look like negative coincidence. Yet, nothing will be working. It's either you just missed it or it never happened. And then you are wondering what is happening. Your seasons are being manipulated. Your seasons are being eaten up. And the insurance system of the spirit for recalibrating season is prayer. Have you not seen the man that was at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5? For 38 years, the guy was there. The people they brought before him had gone. The ones they brought after him, they were also delivered and left. But there was something about this man. He said, when the water is dead, before he gets in, somebody else will enter. So there was something happening. When the water is not stirred, he's sober. When the water is not stirred, he's strategically positioned. But the moment he turns away, that's when the water is stirred. Because something was happening to his season. And for 38 years, he was dead. If not for mercy that Jesus came, he would have died there. And instead of him praying, he was there lamenting. So much so that even when Jesus came, would that be made whole? He went back narrating his ordeal to tell you why he was where he was. Because he didn't know what to do with his mouth. Your mouth is not given to you for lamentation and murmuring. Your mouth is given to you to shape your destiny through prayer and priesthood. Why do you pray? Number three, prayer changes your season. For those of us who understand prayer, even the things that are supposed to happen in 10 years, we can draw them close. <laughs> I wish you understood what I'm saying. You know what prayer does? When you start praying, sometimes your actual season will change. And I will show you from scripture. 
If you study Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4, from verse 1, the Bible said the Spirit drove Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So that season was supposed to be a season of temptation, a season of trial. But Jesus did something. The Bible said before the devil came, he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. And so that season was no longer just a season of temptation. It became a season of manifestation. So Jesus used prayer and fasting to alter that season. And when Jesus was coming down from that mountain, because he had added prayer and fasting for 40 days, the Bible said the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentile, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. And instantly the Bible said his fame went abroad. Immediately Jesus entered the synagogue and said the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to put the glad tidings to the poor. Immediately he started operating in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He knew something that instead of me just to go to be tempted and come back for God to say well done, you passed the test. There is something I can do to merge that season with another season. And so the season of temptation became the season of power and it became the season of manifestation. His fame went abroad because he explored the altar in prayer. And so two ways that prayer changes your season is that prayer can draw your possibilities closer to you. So what should have happened in 10 years, you can make it happen in two weeks when you start praying. What should have happened in five years, you can make it happen in three months when you start praying. Because what prayer will do is that prayer will cause the realms to begin to align to you. You know the Bible said, the lines have fallen onto you in pleasant places. That means the lines were not designed to be in pleasant places. But something happened that made the lines to fall in pleasant places. That's how seasons are regulated. When you start praying, you can alter and selectively rearrange your season for your season to favor you. And if your season does not change, you will now change. You know what will happen? When you start praying, the Bible said the hand of God came upon Elijah and he outran the chariot of Ahab unto Jezreel. So it's either your season draws close or prayer adds speed to you. And so you run meet your season. Because the step you are taking currently will take you 10 years to get there. The step you are taking currently will take you 5 years to get there. But when you start praying, there is a technology that is activated. It said the hand of God will descend. And in 1 Kings 18 verse 46, it said the hand of God came upon Elijah. It was not designed for the hand of God to come upon him, but he provoked it in prayer. The Bible said seven times Elijah prayed. He put his head in between his thighs and he was praying. He said, go and check. Elisha checked. Six times, nothing happened. He kept praying because he was manipulating the atmosphere. It was not time for rain, but the guy knew how to change seasons. He knew that now rain cannot fall. Imagine, it had not rained for three and a half years. So if you are waiting for rainy season, three and a half years have passed. The season has not come. So what can change the season was prayer. And the guy was praying, say check. He was praying, he said check. He was praying, he said check. Now on the seventh time when he checked, he said, I saw something that looked like the feast of a man. He said, that's enough. What I was looking for was a sign. What you have seen there is a sound of an abundance of rain. I have altered the season. I have changed three years of dry season into an instant raining season on the altar. And as if that is not enough, when he altered the season, something else happened. The Bible said the hand of God came upon Elijah and he outran the chariot. In those days, the chariot of the king is the fastest chariot. But you know what? When you have prayed, even the king can no longer match you. You become faster than the king. So Elijah outran the chariot of the king and entered the gate of Jezreel. You find certain Christians, their life look like a snail movement. They receive one little help five years ago. The next help is five years later. Something is wrong with their prayer altar. Something is wrong. You can either cause the rain to come or you can outrun the chariots of Ahab. But it will take prayer. And you know that kind of prayer is not a casual prayer. When James was talking about it, he called it the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. It is effectual. It is fervent. What does it mean to be effectual? 
it is deliberately tailored it is not an absent-minded kind of prayer it's a prayer with a lot of focus for a specific target and what does it mean to be fervent it is heartfelt your heart is in that prayer praying and laboring pumping energies of the spirit pumping vibrations of the spirit pumping hunger of the spirit and as you are drilling there after a while even if it had not rained for 10 years the cloud will appear this is how men change their stories they change their stories through prayer there are many christians who are waiting for things to happen it will never happen did you not read Acts 16 paul and barnabas and silas the bible said they threw them into prison in fact they threw the key away they were not they were not planning to release them be there rot in jail but they knew something the bible said at midnight ah, i wish i had time to talk to you about midnight the midnight hour is the hour of warfare the hour of government they waited until midnight because they knew something about the midnight when men were sleeping that's when they started walking he said as they prayed suddenly an angel descended shattered the foundation of the prison and the gates opened on their own accord so their deliverance would have tarried for many months but they changed that season because of prayer i don't know what you are going through but as you pray tonight something will change those papers you are waiting for and they told you this thing can take only three years it can take two weeks if you pray enough you can change the season why did they say it will take two years because somebody is there who is existing because there is a policy that is there what if they change that person overnight anything is possible to the man that believes and prays prayer is not a joke it's the weapon of the believer we war with prayer we war with prayer when you want to find a warrior in the spirit don't look at his suit look at his, the strength of his legislation in the place of prayer enemies devils may gang up against you it means nothing all your challenges can become a platform of manifestation if you know what to do in prayer your platform is not an elevated spot like this one no your platform are the challenges that swallow other men because when men are cast down you come you say there's a lifting up the bible didn't say if you come there will be a lifting up you too are supposed to be cast down it is your utterance that change your own story he said when you come you say that's prayer there's a lifting up and so what destroyed other men becomes the platform for your own manifestation you can change anything by prayer and anything can become anything if you will pray this is why the devil will let you do everything but prayer you can do anything you want to do but don't pray so long as you don't pray the devil is okay because he knows that the moment you start praying his kingdom is in trouble the vibrations of God the powers of God the anointing of the Holy Ghost everything begins to navigate in your direction and you will rise up as a prince prayer let's pray I have spoken enough I have spoken enough let's pray these three that I've said if you engage it tonight somebody's story can change <laughs> can we pray a little or do I add one more <laughs> do I add one more man taka barakaya zege baraka sosta fracte why do we pray number four because prayer moves mountains there are many ways the devil fights if the devil cannot alter your season, he will plant a mountain, mountain in front of you. What is a mountain? They are spiritual forces designed to slow you down or to bring absolute hindrance to your progress. And so it stops in front of you, you can pass. No matter how you try. Imagine if you were to climb to Mount Everest before you arrive at your destination. A mountain that is 6,000 feet tall. So if you climb it, that's 6,000. You climb down, that's 12,000 before you make your journey how can you arrive and what the devil does is that he litters mountains in front of men and Jesus said the cure to mountains 
is to put your faith to work. He said, but the way you put your faith to work is by praying. He said, if there's a mountain before you, address that mountain. Don't doubt in your heart. And he said, that mountain shall be removed. And in verse 24 of Mark 11, he said, whatsoever ye desire, the only time you can have it, including removing the mountain, is when you pray. That means your desires will never come until you pray. The mountains will never go until you pray. So that thing that is ahead of you is there because you have not addressed it. And so when we go to the place of prayer, we are removing and uprooting mountains. That's why some of you, when you pray, you sweat as though they are pouring buckets of water on you. It is the level of labor you are engaging. Somebody else may have removed these mountains so he can pocket his hand and pray because the mountains are no more. He's only fellowshipping with God because that's also one of the reasons we pray. And you can see him, Mandara Atefrek Histora Actis. He's enjoying fellowship because he has removed this mountain. But you, you have 20 mountains ahead of you. You cannot afford to pocket your hand and say, Marida, Akobra, Kadakira, Atos. No. When you are praying, is ego rogo go avavaka koka koa arigo manana suzu azakaya tuata mereguata because you will need prophecy to come out you will need stamina to tarry because some of those man mountains is when you pray to deep that the prophecy that will remove it will come out of your spirit and so you can't pray casually you will pray until prophecies come out because you are praying to remove a mountain and trust me, your life will not count much until you remove those mountains. The devil knows, Jesus himself knows, that mountains will slow you down. What you should do at the age of 30, you can end up doing it at 70. You can do it at 80. And you will not do enough of it anymore. Because you would have wasted all your energy before you even started. There's nothing wrong in achieving it late. It shows doggedness, it shows discipline, it shows passion. But it's better when you find it early. That's why you cannot allow what should happen today happen tomorrow. Because there's a mountain stopping you. I don't know if you want to pray. But me, I want to pray a little. Can we pray in the Holy Ghost? For just 10 minutes. For 10 minutes. I don't know what you are dressing. I don't know what you are dealing with. Me, I'm trusting God for transfiguration. Go. But where I came from, we pray like what if we pray all depends on prayer. Everything depends on prayer. 